I'm gonna grab some of that wifey type lip balm. Okay, okay, I've got some hot lemon skits. Oh, that's good. I think that'll really help. And, um, okay, I guess we'll just grab that big box of things we've watched, played, and listened to. The ones that are infused with balsam so they don't hurt your nose. Oh, gosh, yeah. Okay, I think I think we can power through. I think we can go. Greetings, strangers, queer and pleasant. I'm not Laura Kate Magnetdale. And I'm not Jane Aris Magnetdale. And welcome to another episode of Queer and Pleasant Strangers. It's a podcast with two queer wifey types, that's us. Uh, we're, we're with, with wifey ones. Uh, do queer trans women have a bit of a catch up about media we've consumed in the week and do we silly share a life and, and skits. germs? Yeah, yeah. If one of us gets ill, inevitably the other one will get ill a little later. The the, the illness will will float around the house. It will. Yeah. How are yeah. you doing? Apart from a little bit snuffly. I'm a, I'm okay. I'm a little bit snuffly. It's not like last week when I had a fucking migraine. That was rough. I had, a, I had a day where I was just out of out of commission. You but were, surely were. Well, you say you were out of commission. You still streamed. I mean, in the dark and true. I mean, I I pushed an hour and a half stream out, and then ultimately was like, I, I really shouldn't have. That was not a good. That was like that was like eight hours after the worst of it. Yeah. And in hind- yeah, probably shouldn't have done. But there was a game I really, really wanted to be playing, despite the fact I was dying. Well, since it's a thing you've played. And it's the thing you really, really wanted to play. Why don't you tell us about the thing you really, it's really wanted to play? It's the primary thing I've been, I've been engaging with media-wise this week mm-hmm. uh, by quite a long stretch. Anytime I haven't been working this week, I have been playing Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, oh, which is the new uh, RPG dr- uh, Yakuza. Uh, Yakuza game. Um, for anyone who isn't familiar with the series, the first six Yakuza games are all about a man named Kiryu having very dramatic uh, crime dramas with occasional silliness inside quests and, and then, sort of real-time punch em up combat. Yeah, and then they did and, that one about that guy called Joryu. Uh, yeah, Joryu, who is definitely not Kiryu. I don't know why people keep calling him Kiryu. So weird. Uh, yeah, Ki- Kiryu died. This is a very different person. Definitely. Uh, but then... The- there is the the uh, the the Lyca Dragon, which was always the Japanese name of the series, but they uh, they started doing RPG ones with the new protagonist called Ichiban, and uh, the the first RPG one with Ichiban, I guess Yakuza Seven, was the first one that I really got into. It's the first one that really grabbed me. Um, it feels a bit more lighthearted. Like Yakuza's yeah. always a bit been a bit not not about being a bit silly, but I feel like like a Dragon felt like the first one that was leaning more heavily the, into the balance a bit like was a little shifted there's a, there's a few things that are different that i think got me on board a bit more easily so like um a, a big reason why i started playing that first one was um i got a review unit of the xbox series x and it was one of the few titles i got review code for that was like had a patch for the series x in that couple of weeks hmm. before release uh, and so i was had like accessibility settings it did and i was like that's a, that's a thing i can i can play around with and I love Ichiban, the the RPG protagonist. The best way to sum him up is, I want to be a Dragon Quest protagonist. I love my JRPGs. I want to be the JRPG protagonist. And that manifests as, you know, I wish to do acts of heroism. I'm going to encapsulate these side quests very much as like JRPG quests. I might imagine the people I'm having street fights with as if they've transformed into wonderful creatures because this is an adventure game. And it's the adventures of this bumbling man trying to just... hes He reminds me of Luffy from One Piece. He's just sincere and endearing to a fault. And no matter whether people want to be his friends or not, they will inevitably end up becoming his friends because he's. You might have pulled a gun on him two weeks ago, but he... now you're besties. And yeah, you're sharing a flat and you're going yeah. on an adventure. Yes, yes. Um, so the first one, the first one of these that came out a few years ago, it definitely did skew a bit more toward the silly than the serious. And like, don't get me wrong, there is a tough as nail serious crime drama nestled in here with very dramatic uh, performances and but there's also like, street car racing yeah you've got like moments of like real emotional tension broken up with time for mario kart down by the pier with like throwing throwing literal dynamite at other cars yep and, and you know the uh 
board meeting yes. simulator Bo- with a chicken. <laughs> yeah, where your your boardroom meetings. You're running a company, and your boardroom meetings are Pokemon battles. Like that was a whole thing. Um, but yeah, for first one, very very much enjoyed. The 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 pieces of of Yakuza were all the same, but just skewed a little more toward the 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 silly. Yeah. Um, Infinite Wealth is everything I really liked about the first game just really ramped up. Mm. Um, Mechanically, I think there's a lot of really smart changes that have been made to just streamline a lot of the RPG mechanics. Um, Things like any... uh, In in the first one, there was one specific job class for one character where if they did regular attacks, it would refill their their magic meter. That's now just a thing across the board for all characters, regardless of job. So you're constantly like, regular attacks will always get you more magic for your specials. Okay, so you're all, always get you you've got more opportunities to do to, the to cool do the, thing. Yeah, you've got more opportunity to do the cool things. Uh and your regular normal like melee attacks are a lot more situationally useful now. Um yeah. you have a little circle around you uh before you do your turn based move that you can move around in and that can allow you to let's say, move yourself so that when you punch that character, you'll knock them into another character and deal damage as the two enemies sort of collide with each other. Or position yourself so that one party member is in front of the enemy and one's behind them, so when you knock the the enemy back, your other party member will get a chance to hit them as well. Attack of opportunity. Exactly! Um, There's a lot of improved access to things like um, using environmental objects as weapons and being able to move around in your little circle and get an icon that pops up and goes... You're currently near a traffic cone. If you do a melee attack now, you'll use that as a weapon. Yeah. Or if a bicycle. You... Yeah, and sometimes it's just like as you go further on, it's things like if you stand next to one of your other party members and do your melee attack, maybe you'll both do a, a combo attack together. Things yes. like that. Um, on top of that, there is a lot more encouragement to change job classes very regularly because mm. the first RPG. Uh, most you got the biggest buffs in stats from your job class leveling up, and like your character leveled up, and separately the job class leveled up, and that meant that if you changed job class, you had quite a significant drop in stats. Right. Whereas now most of the stat gain is on your character, and the job classes are only for like unlocking new abilities and moves, really. Right. Which means that you have less of a drop off when you do that. Um, all of those kind of little quality of life changes. Very much appreciated. Just really helped this to feel a bit faster. Um, another one I've just thought of that I really like is when you out-level a fight by a certain amount, mm. you can just press L2 when you touch a fight and just auto-win the fight. Right. You don't get as much experience, but you get the full amount of money. Okay. Um, so if you are primarily just trying to grind for cash, you can just go to a mob you know you're going to win against, press L2, instant, go, go, go. How else will you save up all the money for slot cards or whatever? Well, exactly. Um... There are things about this uh, game that are definitely going to be d- divisive. There are things that I don't mind, but I know are like worth knowing. Um, first of all, this is not just. Whereas the first Like a Dragon was Ichiban's story, and you could you could even though it was the seventh Yakuza game, you could kind of just jump in there, not knowing anything about any of the past Yakuza games, yeah. and it was a good fresh start you could jump in with. To play Infinite Wealth, you probably need at least a little bit of other knowledge about Yakuza other than Ichiban's first adventure. You could probably get away with that being the shorter one that got released a couple of months ago, uh, The, the Man, Man Who Erased His name. name, because there's a guy called Kiryu. He's kind of... What? His yeah. name's Kiryu? There's a guy called Kiryu. He's he's He was the protagonist for six other uh, Yakuza games. All you really need to know about him is he was also very sincere, but in a much more like stoic way. Mm. Um... He's going to be part of the adventure now. I think they do a pretty good job of going, if you don't know who Kiryu is at all, making him feel like the right kind of big deal and helping you kind of understand the role he played. But I think having at least one game where you play as him before this uh, helps. Um, I've been very much enjoying the new setting. Uh, it It is set in... The, the bulk of the game is set in Hawaii and... There is a really big, densely packed, very varied map that I've very much been enjoying. Um, I appreciate a lot of the map traversal changes they've made to accommodate for the larger map. Things like not having to go find a taxi in the map before you can do fast travel to another taxi point. Mm -hmm. Having additional fast travel methods other than 
you know, teleporting around the map that are available. Like, you can ride around on little segways. Yes. Um, I have been very impressed at how well this game has tackled very present modern social issues in a very respectful way, particularly when it comes to uh, issues impacting the people of Hawaii today that are not being talked about enough. Yes. And I am very glad to see a thing that has a good English dub and will probably be played by a lot of Americans about a lot of the ways that America and the United States are fucking over Hawaii. Yes. Um, that's really nice. It's been nice to see a good degree of understanding of, um, not just the tourist facing aspects of Hawaii mm. and aspects of like religious belief and cultural belief and sort of the, history of the uh the melting pot nature of the area mm. um there's been a lot of really nice hawaii specific context that i appreciate that it doesn't just feel like a backdrop for something different yeah and also the the poverty felt by certain groups yeah. of people there there's there's a lot of aspects of it that feel like um yeah there, there was a whole there was a whole uh moment reasonably early on where there was a whole discussion about um uh, about about a homeless person had tried to steal one of our party members uh wallet and it got into a conversation about like the way that the united states often uses hawaii as a place to dump homeless people they don't want to deal with on the united states mainland mm. and the ways that a very high tourist focused cost of living alongside homeless people who can't really afford to leave uh, can create a real cycle of of behavior that needs specific help to you know help those communities, um, and is also a, perhaps more prone or at risk of than others to yeah. falling in with groups around organized crime. Yep, and again, not specifically looking at Hawaii, but I think this game generally, yeah. like both in Hawaii and at the start that takes place in Japan is doing a really good job of acknowledging something that I very rarely see talked about in media, the idea of if you punish people for being in situations that, you know, uh, be it, if you punish people who did crimes in the past and make it difficult for them to reintegrate into society, or you take populations who do not have much choice other than crime and punish them for their own existence, all you really do is perpetuate a cycle of crime, because if you don't give people... If you make it difficult for people to get into, you know, a good honest living, mm -hmm. they're not going to have much other option to survive. It's either die or do crime sometimes. Yes. And be that the Yakuza not being able to, like, get a bank account and uh, therefore not get a job and therefore not get an apartment for five years after they leave, or, you know homeless people having similar issues with over-policing and inability to get part, uh, you know, bank accounts over mm -hmm. in Hawaii create very and similar cycles. Just about everywhere, as far as I can tell. Well, indeed, but I mean of the places that they sort of directly address. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of, like, very good, uh, you know, very present social commentary and uh, very intense crime drama mixed in with the most exorbitant amount of silly way too in-depth, why did you make it this in-depth, I love it, side quest content of any RPG I've ever played. I've, There's a whole Animal Crossing in there. The, uh, yeah, I unlocked, I unlocked the Animal Crossing tonight. I'm currently I'm currently doing Animal Crossing. Um, and when I say there's a whole Animal Crossing in there, um, I just unlocked the pathing system so I can lay down my own paths. Okay. And if I've got buildings that my villagers are going to visit, I have to make sure that the buildings are on a path so that the villagers will go to them. Fair. Uh, but there's also, uh, there are people trying to use the, the Animal Crossing Island as a place to dump their trash, oh, no. who will occasionally come and try and fight my village, uh, my, my new villagers away, mm -hmm. so that they can continue using it as a trash dump, so I have to go fight them off, while trying to like, cr get crafting materials to make new little crafting things. Okay. But also there's a Pokemon, there's an entire Pokemon minigame, but this it's, game was so designed for you, huh? Right, right. There's a whole Pokemon minigame with, like, gyms and an Elite Four. Sorry, the Discrete Four. Um, but it's not Pokemon. It's just it's just people. It's just real-ass human beings that you beat them in a fight and occasionally you'll offer them, like, a box of chocolates and go, do you want to chew in my fight squad? Um, Regular people, gotta catch them all. Yeah, yeah. Um, got, gotta, gotta catch them all indeed, or legally distinct alternative. 
I'm um, pretty sure it does say several times, uh, you've got to get got, them all. It's got to dispatch them all, uh, rather than got to catch them all, I think. Mm. Um, but that that whole side quest and minigame is so lovingly referential. It, it's so tongue-in-cheek about the things it's referencing in Pokemon. Yeah. It never feels like it's trying to make fun of the concept. It feels very loving. Um, I love the mechanics of the weird Pokemon side game. It's it's pretty simple and it keeps it fast, but you basically have like five types uh, that have like your sort of rock, paper, scissors mechanics. Uh, water, fire, and grass do a triangle. Dark and light sort of a, uh, a strong against each other, but also right. weak against each other in a very direct way. And you have like three on three battles, three three Sujimon out at once, three in reserve. And it's all about... Um, Whichever Sujimon you get to attack with will do their element of attack uh, in front of themselves, and that'll be their strongest attack, and then also to either side in a weaker form. Right. And those, uh, any that hits super effective will build up a meter for doing special attacks. Okay, so you've got positioning, you've got typing, yep. you've got um, every, advantages. every turn you can swap the positions of two of your Sujimon, and that can either be swapping one that's active for one on the bench, or the positions of some of the, some of the ones that are currently actively out, mm. in order to minimize damage taken by incoming special effective damage. Okay. Um, you... It's a real little juggling act of trying to position your different type advantages in the right kind of way. Yeah. And different Sujimon you get will have different abilities as well on top of that. So you can have things like one that's focused on healing for its special moves, some that don't have special moves at all, but they have like considerably stronger basic attacks uh, to sort of account for that. Yeah. Um, and just, there's, there's Pokestops and raids and uh, rare candies and, and evol- evolution mechanics and, it, that's a whole. That's a whole other side quest. Now, have you been putting your duplicate people into the machine and having them turned I, into candy? I have been having my my people eat their duplicates for evolution purposes. Don't judge me. It's fine. It's fine. They consented. It's fine. Okay. Um. But yeah, I I have put like thirty hours into this game. What day did it arrive? Um. I got code on Thursday. And okay. Did a, be- I did like a big lengthy session on Thursday. Did yeah. big lengthy session. You've done weekend. a couple of streams. Yeah, done it. Done a few streams on top. Um, I've made so little progress on the actual plot <laughs> of this game, and that's the way I like it. Um, uh-huh, uh-huh. I I'm consistently impressed by this game's ability to catch me off guard with uh, mixing the silly and the sweet and the sincere together in very unexpected ways. Um, the, I don't want to spoil anything, but for anyone who's played, there is a quest that starts with a man really wanting to see snow in Hawaii Aww. for his, 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 his dying wife, despite it being very hot in Hawaii at the time. And there's a point in the middle of that quest thread where I started chasing a runaway pram, and I was very confused as to how that was going to be to do with because finding... Because it was still very clearly part of the same Yeah, quest. like, on the minimap, it was like, yeah, continue the quest for the man who's trying to make snow for his wife, and I get there, and a runaway pram happens, I'm chasing after it. I had no idea how that was going to be relevant. I could not have predicted how it would be relevant. No? But it was such a perfect solution to the stupid problem, and I, it was very much a ha-ha-ha... That's a very funny solution. Oh, that's actually very sweet and very sincere. Thank, thank you so much. For and maybe a little bit gross towards the end. A, a little, maybe a little <laughs> bit gross towards the end. But but in a way where it was like, you know, look, look, sacrifice- it was deeply endearing. Sacrifices were made for the greater good, and I appreciate that. And yep. like that, while also not being offensive to any particular. Groups. No, no, there is there is a group in that quest line that uh, could very much have been made the butt of the joke, yes. and I don't think they were. I think. No. I think that quest is, like, a real good example of what, like, Ichiban, uh, like a dragon games, do well. Yes, because, uh, like, another example was uh, the Tinder dating. Yes, yes. Like, you said that at one point he turned up and the, the person was much older yeah. than, uh, th- than had been sort of de- stated on the dating profile, and he was like, eh, okay. Yeah, yeah, there was, you know, there's there's a whole Tinder dating minigame where the gimmick is you do, you do the texting back and forth, ultimately you get the date and it'll be a catfish of some kind. It won't be the person that you thought you were talking to. But yeah, one of them was uh, like, oh, I'm talking with this person that's into S&M. 
it turned out to be an old lady who was into S and M, and Ichiban didn't seem that put off. And I was like, okay, yeah, you could have taken the the cheap shot there. You didn't. Yeah. It's it's felt. I continue to be impressed at how frequently it feels in good taste, despite. It's silliness. Yeah, it manages to do ridiculousness and things that are out of the ordinary without punching down for the most part. Yeah. You'll... I, I The first Like a Dragon with Ichiban had a few enemy types that felt a little punch downy. Um, yes. But, uh, there was a couple of the, yeah. the homeless characters uh, yeah. who, when they were like turning up as enemies, the, the <sighs> names that they were given were yes. kind the, of shitty. The one I remember from, from the first one was you have like a very sweet, sincere storyline with the homeless camp and like Ichiban ha- being kind of schooled on the fact that like, hey, it's harder to get out of homeless th- homelessness than you might imagine, Ichiban. Like, don't. Don't just go tell them to get a job. Yeah, um, we're not just going to go to the social services and immediately have all yeah, of our problems but, solved. But, like, two minutes later, you t- you bumped into Hungry Hungry Homeless as an enemy type. Yeah. There's been, there's been considerably less of that here. Um, I'm glad. But, yeah, generally so. I've been... I have just been engrossed by this game. It is mechanically scratching all of my itches. It's giving me so many things to be getting on with. The... The core plot is incredibly engaging. I have so many questions about the mystery going on. I have theories. I cannot wait to find out what happens next, except I definitely can wait to find out what happens next, because there's so many really good little side quests in between me doing endless rounds of karaoke and (laughs) bonding with my new little group of friends I have found along the way. And honestly, I really like the new... the, The two new party members... The for the first two party member editions in this, um, I th- I thought I would struggle to care as much about uh, anyone Ichiban was adventuring with as much as his first adventuring party. Yeah. They've done a really good job of making these characters I care about. Um, things to know up front. It's like five plus hours before you really get to the game in this game. Um. The Yakuza games have always had a bit of a front-loading of very narrative-heavy, kind of linear, go to this, cutscene, go to this, cutscene, maybe a little bit of fighting, go to this, cutscene, yeah. before they really, like, take the training wheels off and open up the open world. Yeah, there's a lot of setup. Yeah. You, you are initially quite railroaded, but after that, you yeah. are going to have an astonishing amount of freedom. Yes, and that has always been the case for these games, but... Never more so than this. Um, the first Ich Ichiban's first like a dragon adventure, I think, was like two and a half to three hours, maybe, to get to like the world has opened up. Genuinely closer to five hours in yeah. this. Um, like it you bef- until I was surprised how much of this game, considering that like all the marketing was like it takes place in Hawaii. I was like four hours in and had not heard mention of Hawaii <laughs> or any references to why I would end up in Hawaii. And I respect that. The game, the game does not rush itself. It takes its time, and I I don't think any of that opening five hours is bad. But it is, it takes a minute to do its thing before going cool. Now off you go. Yeah, um, and uh, which is also a little bit unusual because the demo didn't yes. appear to be loaded in that quite that heavily in that direction. Um, yeah, the the demo that existed in the man who raised his name just sort of dropped you in Hawaii with like one little cutscene going, "I'm going to Hawaii now. Here I am." Yeah, they there was a lot. Um, absent from a lot of context absent from that demo which i think is great yeah like that demo was as substantial as it was and gave so little away is really impressive yeah i mean it was it, it was impressive that you sort of got into it and there are a few times you're like well I, I imagine i'm probably near the end of this and no no i'm still going yeah 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 um genuinely cannot say enough positive about this game it is it is the most engaged i've been in a in a like a turn-based RPG in a while. Um, I... This is filling that spot that last year Hi-Fi Rush did, where it's like barely a month into the year and I'm already going, this is probably going to be Game of the Year material for me. Um, absolutely loving it. I... I have heard people say that like, oh, just to to mainline the main story, they took like 70, 80 hours. Mm. Uh, like, you know, people doing their review playthroughs who skipped most of the side content, and I'm like, that's great to hear, 
I'm ready to be playing this for a while. Um, yeah, I feel like it would be very weird to try and do a review on this, missing so much of the side content, where the side content is tend to be such a big thing in these games. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where, like, I've spoken to a lot of people who did review this, where it was like, Every time new side quests hopped up, uh, popped up, I did like three or four of them to get a flavor to for get it. a flavor for what was popping up. But so many of the side quests in this, so many of my favorite side quests in this, have been side quests that would not pop up unless you'd done several other prerequisites, seemingly yeah. unconnected prerequisites first. Like, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, there is two different side quests about filmmaking. That yes. you have to do before they combine and secretly turn out to be <laughs> one finale of a side quest yeah. about filmmaking. And there's so many quests like that where it's like, seemingly unconnected things lead to other things and you just wouldn't find that side quest. There was a side quest I found uh, yesterday um, where a woman was talking about her chicken being um, being abducted by a UFO. Okay. And... It took me way too long to realise that was a continuation of another quest. <laughs> I was like three quarters of the way through that quest before I realised, oh, uh, oh, I'm in part two of that quest, am I? Like, it, it does a really good job of, like, bringing side quest plot threads back later as other quests without telling you that's what it's doing. Yeah, I know at one point you were doing, like, just a friendship getting to know the rest of the party section where you stumbled on something that, like... About an hour or so later, someone was like, I'm looking for this thing. Oh, yeah. I just stumbled on a tree and, uh, it, you know, made a little comment on the tree. And then later stumbled on a side quest. It was like, oh, I know about that tree. Yeah. I, I do know that tree. Hi, yeah. It's, it's such a nicely built world in terms of feeling like there is constantly lived in stuff everywhere. Be that, you know, once you unlock the, the Pokemon mechanic, there's Pokemon trainers on every fucking corner of the street. Or be it... The stupid little mechanic of just saying hello to random strangers, and sometimes a little smile meter will go up, and you can befriend people by just Aww. walking past and pressing the hello button to say hi to, to just people on the street, or going in the ocean and picking up trash to recycle. Yeah, it's damn. This game is sweet and funny, and at times brutal and really fun to play. God damn, I love this game. Yeah. I am really fucking hooked on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, what about you? What have you been playing? Uh, well, we played some things together. We went and played some board games with some friends. We did. Uh, yeah, so um, I, gu I guess first one, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of an oddity, really. Not really Not really something I would have ever chosen to play myself. Oh, I know which one we're starting with. Uh, this was the Taskmaster board game. Yes, based I, based on the TV show that I don't know whether is really known outside of the UK. Uh, I, I don't know. It, I, I occasionally get, like, sh clips of it fed to me on TikTok, but that's about it. Like, it, I've, I've never watched an episode. You've apparently watched a few. I, I've watched a few, like, sometimes when travelling, when I need kind of, like, brainless background yeah. info. It's... It's a TV sh game sh game show loosely for comedians. It's, yeah, it's basically like a like a like a British panel show, but the format is here will be a, a silly, ridiculous task that maybe there's a clever way to think about, or maybe you just have to make a bit of a fool of yourself to do. Yes, uh, comedians try and do the task, and arbitrarily points will be assigned based on the the host's d deeming Wins. of whether he likes how you did. Yes, um, but made as a board game. Yes. Now. Which, uh, I, according to one review, sounded frankly terrifying and very chaotic, and I was like, well, the, I'm glad we're not playing this here. Yes, the example <laughs> you gave from that review was like... It could be everything from paint your finger blue, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, colour your finger in, to uh, spray paint a frying pan blue. And I was like, that, f that feels like quite yeah. a destructive art. I don't want to desecrate someone else's home cookware. Nor do I want anyone else to do it here. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, it wasn't quite that bad. There, there were a couple that we were just like, we're not doing that. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a few of, uh, it's been quite wet outside, we probably won't do a huge amount that specifically requires us to go out in the garden. The, I think the main problem there being that, like, the, the challenges are divided into, um, technically rooms. Yeah. And you have the lab, the garden, uh, the living room. I, and the kitchen, 
I think. Yeah. And then there's also some secret tasks and some final tasks for the, for the yeah. very last challenge. But it seemed like they were going to be more themed around the thing. And all, but also, who has a lab? Where where where, yeah. where does one work that out? It it was a, a little game? loose with the theming, and I it think was. that was to its benefit. Yes. And it, it certainly didn't feel nearly as destructive, although things did get fairly chaotic with someone putting a clod of dirt in their mouth. Uh, yeah, no, that that was not required of them, but they did that, though. It did fall within the terms of the challenge. I made a small soil duck and sung a quack-based version of the Jurassic Park theme. And there was also some throwing of soil and uh, some glitter and a lot of music. And it was it was a silly time that that was uh, not nearly as destructive as I thought. And um, yeah, it was it was all right. I'm I'm definitely not the type of person who goes out of their way to get to like party games and stuff. But yeah, yeah it was it was uh, a pleasant time and wasn't nearly as destructive as I had feared. Yeah, I am glad. Yeah, we we uh, you, we did, how did you do? What was your what was your? I I thought it was a an amusing enough silly little diversion it had it had little tastes of like um don't get got there was a little yes. element of that with like your little secret thing you were trying to achieve but i think generally it was a just here's a sil- here's some silly little activities to do as a framework for like don't worry about the points that much just have some fun being silly together yeah it's not a game i would seek out owning no. but i if it was suggested i wouldn't be like up, I wouldn't be opposed to playing yeah, it. Yeah, I think it is uh, like a, an earlier in the day game. It's not one that you would play as a, hey, we've done a bunch of sort of heavier stuff. Shall we wind down with something a bit lighter? This yeah. is a light, like a warm up game more than anything else, I guess. Yeah, agreed. Uh, we also played a, a, a four player game of Stardew Valley. We did, yeah. Which, uh, we, I th- we think we talked about Stardew Valley last week. Uh, that, uh, I'd been, I'd been playing a bunch of it solo, and we played uh, a few two-player games together, uh, but this was the first time we played with other people, and four players... I mean, first of all, it feels, as someone who's played a lot of solo, like it's way more insurmountable. And that's Uh... partly due to the fact that in solo, it's like, okay, I need ten coins for that mission, and ten coins for that mission, and I need maybe ten coins for that, and I'll probably need... Six to eight hearts, probably. Maybe a few more extra. And then to look at the start of a uh, a four-player game going, oh, okay, I will absolutely need somewhere in the region of uh, 120 gold and maybe 20 or 30 hearts total. Mm. It, it feels uh, quite, quite uh, intimidating, but it's definitely not that bad. Yeah, it's it's big numbers to look at that when you actually think about it in practice, it's like, oh, we have... I, I, four of us. This is way more achievable. Yeah. It scales well. But that's that's the thing, is when you've got a full team of four, you can have, like, a person specialised for each task. Yes. And that lets you really snowball your investment in those tasks. Yeah, and you also get to play more. off the synergies of, of the different characters. Yeah. Like, uh, the uh, forager and the farmer definitely synergise really well. Uh, the... Having somebody able to do uh, the fishing aspect means that they're not feeling like they're getting in the way of anything. They're not feeling like they're like a spare wheel as far as other tasks are going, uh, which I think would be very easy to, to, to have as a situation. But in this case, I think it works very well that they can do that. And then, of course, you've got the miner who mm. is is desperately trying to... Uh, Make sure that there's enough uh, ore for upgrading people's items and um, uh, geodes or whatever whatever else is being required specifically for uh, the the bundles. Yeah, and I think they do uh, do a really good job of, of making that scalable and and good fun. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, then we played some of the Discworld and Warport game. Oh yes. Which uh, yeah, it's it's. It's a fascinating little game. It's, I would say it's fairly lightweight. It's, it's Agreed. It's not, not super uh, difficult to, to understand the basic rules and the basic uh, layout of the thing. And then, um, you because you, you're basically, you have a big map in the middle, you have uh, a bunch of pawns that you're placing out, and there's uh, aspects of area control, there's aspects of uh, like building up, there's uh, obviously you're trying to get money and things. 
Uh, cards will have, a, I think there's like eight different symbols on them. And it'll be things like, you'll either do what it says on the text of the card, or you'll do, uh, or you might do something like the text of the card and play another card, or uh, you might have uh, to build a building, as long as mm-hmm. you fulfill criteria for building a building. There, like, there's lots of different ways that you can play cards. But I think the, the thing that really makes it shine and makes it really uh, fascinating is the, the idea that potentially everybody has completely different uh, objectives. Like objectives. Yeah. So you you might have someone who's uh, specifically trying to get a certain amount of money before the end. You might have somebody who's kind of aiming to uh, control a certain amount of area or uh, 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 have like the highest amount of people in a certain number of areas. Mm-hmm. And it's the idea that there's these hidden roles on top of everything else. And then also you've got Cards that might just make completely random effects happen. Yes. And you've got to be careful with those because it might be that somebody is trying to get as much trouble as possible uh, spreading around in the uh, mm. in, in the city of Eckmorepork. And uh, yeah, I think it's a, a really fascinating idea. I think yeah. it's like e- ve- a very easy to teach. Yeah, it is. It is a deceptively interesting game in that it is very much like... You you have your little hand of cards, and most turns you're only playing a single card that will do a couple of things at the top of the card. Maybe you can chain a couple of, of actions if you get lucky and have cards that say play another. But you're like, I'm laser focused in on doing one of like six possible objectives this game might be looking for. Everyone at the table is probably going to be keeping an eye out for the bulk of those as best they can remember them. And if I am too aggressive seeking my objective... That's going to get noticed. Yes. And I, you know, it, it, it is a real game of, and I think you did this very well, putting, doing several different things that aren't actually your objective to try and make one of them get caught on at, at the table as this is what they're going for. Oh, yeah. There is a good amount of bluffing in this. Yeah. Um, like, because the fact that it's such open information because you are given a player aid mm. and like one of the main things on the player aid is, is here is all the possible people who could be at the table yes. and here are their specific win conditions. Yes. And and by deliberately making a thing of counting my money. Yeah. Deliberately making a thing of counting my cards. Deliberately making a thing of counting my areas and other people's areas around the table. Yeah. When people couldn't really work out which of the many, many things my my yeah. uh, goal was. Yeah. Because there was so much going on. Even but, when you had an opportunity to look at a certain number of the unused roles in the box, yeah. there was still one that was left behind, so you still had a little bit of mystery. Yeah. And, and, and even, I think, even when you know what someone's goal is explicitly, that doesn't mean it's not still tricky to keep them away from it sometimes. Yeah. Like, one of our players accidentally revealed their, their role thinking they'd won and realised they hadn't. Yes. Uh, but even knowing what it was, we were having to, like, as a group around the table, c- like, consolidate resources to go, like, how do we stop that happening? Yeah. And there were some real close shaves. Oh, yes, because if uh, you don't have quite the right cards that could do the right kinds of things, you're just not going to be able to do it. Yeah. It is It is a real interesting mix of, like, deck build worker placement-y hidden roll yeah. mechanics that it, work really nicely. It's a, a fascinating collection of, of ideas bundled together. It's a shame it is out of print. It's a shame that the way it was re-implemented seems like it might be a little bit problematic. <laughs> just a little. Uh, like, I obviously do not know the full details of that, but like just reading the specs on it, it was like, okay, so I can see that they've transposed that character to that character and, and this concept to this concept. Because the theme is Dickens rather than uh, Discworld stuff. And I, 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 it feels like at least one of the the changes they've made feels very problematic just from reading this description. But I haven't played it. But I was just like, ah, oh, maybe I'll see if I can get a copy of this game. I don't particularly want to pay like three hundred quid plus, uh, for for uh my own copy, uh, for on eBay that might even be a yeah. knockoff or whatever. At this point, if if I wanted to play it, I think like uh like trying to find a print and play a print uh, and play, or just to going go. to our friends and play it with it, play it with them again. Yeah, as long as they don't mind us playing with their board game, they could resell for an expensive <laughs> amount of money. It doesn't seem like they're particularly keen on on selling it. So. I'm, I'm glad. But uh, yeah, and you know, game games should be played rather than. Um, scout, yeah, bastards. Indeed, bastard they scouters. they should be. But also, 
I hear the prices those resell for and go, I'm going to be very careful not to spill a drink on this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, well done for sleeving it. Thank you very much for trusting us enough to play it. But, like, you know, like, I'm... <sighs> I had a copy of Battlestar Galactic for the longest time. I bought it because I had watched uh, street people streaming it, and that seemed really fun, playing it through Tabletop Simulator, and that seemed like an awful lot of fun. I have played it in person a few times, but ultimately, it's a little bit too long for me. It can be, uh, can be kind of grueling if you end up as a Cylon and you get revealed like too early in the game, because potentially you're then sitting there for three or four hours with only minimal minimal things to do, yeah. minimal input, uh, and not really feeling like you're part of the game anymore. Which is why whenever I end up getting uh, a silent role in that game, I always just try and be as cooperative as possible for the longest possible time. Because the game's hard enough as it is. It doesn't necessarily behoove you to make the game harder for other people, and then find yourself outed and, and, and having to be... Um, uh, basically having a worse time playing. Agreed. But, uh, yeah, like, and that was going for like 150, 200 quid on eBay. I was like, I could sell it potentially, but then I have all the hassle of posting it. But also, I have a friend who enjoys playing it. So we just gave it to them. And they, hopefully they will get, we get more play out of it than, than I ever managed. Yeah. <sighs> uh, have you played anything else? Ah, uh, we did. We play anything else together we did. at that board we game that. time? Oh, we did. We played yeah. Vivid Memories. Um. So yeah, how would you describe Vivid Memories? It is an abstract game about uh, <sighs> childhood dreams coming to, to kind reality. Of, yeah, trying trying to. Um, <sighs> it, okay. I, it. I think it, it. Its theme is a little bit weird. Yeah. So mechanically. It is a game about, uh, you've got a sort of like, f um, drafting from factories, um, components of different colours. Very similar to Azul yep. Summer Pavilion. And what you are basically trying to do, as best I can explain it, is, um, score points by either taking cards that were underneath drafted tokens that will have point scoring conditions on them. Yep. And you can point score those once and they'll be like, uh, have uh, a piece on your board that only has one yellow and one blue in it or whatever yeah. and that'll score once and the thing will be gone or by connecting nodes on your board uh, via sort of like threads that connect from like one point of a colour to another somewhere else yeah. across the board and you are doing that by every time you draft to uh, these, these coloured tokens you have to put all of them in one sort of hex on your board together yes and you can do things to move them around or manipulate them or change them later, but you're trying to get as many of these coloured tokens as possible to fill out this board, but not so many that you're shooting yourself in the foot on ability to shuffle them around later for point scoring. But also enough that you can activate the tiles that you end up claiming as part of that, that uh, drafting the, the, the coloured pieces. So that you can score it, so that you can flip it over. Because if you don't flip it over, you completely lose access to one of your basic moves. Yeah, it it it's interesting. It's not as complicated as it sounds when you're looking at it, but it's a lot of it it's a lot of abstract things to explain up front. Yeah, like it's got it's. It, I would say it's like a uh, probably a fairly easy teach. I think it's pretty pretty easily understandable. But at the same time, like there is considerably more strategy than you might expect from a uh from the just the way it's just to look at it like it, i think there is a good amount of like different ways of thinking about all these things and uh how you would try and uh make the best possible scoring situation like it seems like scoring can be v like pretty vastly uh different between games based on like which board you've got because there are there's like four different boards which uh, aspiration you've got, like what you ultimately want to do, what colour that is, what random tiles are drawn out of the bag, and what tiles you manage to pull, uh, what, or what um, the, the the memories you're you're pulling out, mm. and what those special the special powers attached to those memories are. Yeah, there's so much going on, and and so many different ways that it could be positive or negative for you. And uh, yeah, I I enjoy it. I think it needs a few more games before we really work it out. But you can bash a game out in like fifteen twenty minutes once it's all set up. And uh, yeah, I think 
the it helps that it's got uh, again it's got quite a nice player aid that you can sit with and try and work out and uh, you you you're not never really strapped for information in that game agreed yeah, yeah. it's 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 a it's an interesting puzzle and i like some of its i particularly like some of its mechanics around drafting the whole idea of you can take three tiles at once if they're all different colors two at once if they're the same color or one but then you get to reshuffle something on your board. Like yes. that that whole mechanic gives some good, interesting flexibility. It's got it's got some very neat ideas oh, to yeah. it. Yeah, it's got some great ideas. And uh, but I think it's gonna take uh, a few more plays before I, I really feel like I've got a handle on it. Yeah, agreed. So, have you played anything else? Uh that's it for me, really. Ah, uh, well then I should guess I should probably talk about my big one. <sighs> yeah, tell us about your big one. Uh so I've been playing uh Mythwind, like a lot of Mythwind. Uh, yeah. Mythwind uh, is a cosy city builder uh, co-op game uh, for one to four players, with, unless you've got the expansion, in which case it's one to five players. I don't have the expansion. Um, where you are a group of people who are going to this sort of fabled Mythwind Valley, and it, there are known to be like uh, mystical creatures there, like sprites, and you're you're just basically just trying to try to build a new home for people. Um, it's quite interesting because uh, a lot of it revolves around the uh, asymmetric um, characters and their custom trays. Mm-hmm. The trays will have uh, different ways of, of laying things out. You'll have fairly standard stuff like all of them will have an ability to slot in uh, five dice on one side. Mm-hmm. So you will generally be able to do a, a skill from one of those um, uh, slots but also later on in your turn, if you've managed to hire some workers, be they sprites or humans, uh, they will come and help you. Or you and I, you could basically pop uh, dice down into those slots and get a little bit of extra uh, action out of your turn at the cost of having hired those workers in the first place. Mm. And depending on, uh, like in an early part of the turn, you place your miniature somewhere on the town board. Mm-hmm. Depending on where you've gone in the town, that might affect which uh, abilities you can trigger during your turn. So it might be that you have gone to the Longhouse, in which case you can um, use either sprites or villagers. But if you have gone to uh, like the building place, that is very specifically you are, are aligned for that day to the villagers. So you will always be doing you you your your personal action will have to be something villager based, mm. um, and it, that that is quite an interesting thing. And slowly as you're expanding the village itself, there will be more places you can go and more things you can do, uh, and you you could even like upgrade certain buildings. So like at one point you might have a building that you can spend uh, a a village dice on and some gold and get a reward. But the upgraded version of that building, or even like a couple of versions later, you could potentially spend like uh, two dice and five gold and get like six times the reward out of it. Okay, yeah. And that ultimately, that those are usually for um, resources that are things like building materials for building other buildings and further expanding the thing. You also have this whole adventure deck that expands. You've got like a little bit of choose your own adventure type stuff. So you'll make decisions for yourself, and then there might also be like a few things that that will just happen. Sometimes hmm. it's just like a thing happened. Read the next card, or or find these these particular cards, or it might be, uh, hey, you've moved into the village, uh, you've started to settle down, you realise there are, are sprites locally. Hmm. You should probably go and talk to the four factions because they seem to be a little bit wary of your villagers. So, like, you'll be told to shuffle four cards in, and uh, peri- periodically, as uh, you draw a weather card every day, if it's got an event card on it, you're going to follow an event, and the events will do very specific things. The weather's also an interesting concept. You have this deck of uh, initially nine cards, and it goes up to ten later on. Mm-hmm. They all have weather symbols on, and, for example, if you're playing as the farmer, depending on what season it is, the weather will maybe give you a free action to plant some crops or harvest some crops mm. depending on, on what is going on and that like that i think that's a, like a really cool idea meanwhile if you're playing as the ranger if they're out on an expedition then weather cards might do things like uh if it's raining it might be uh that the expedition gets longer mm. you have to add an extra card to it 
and potentially if you haven't uh, accounted for that in the things you've taken along on your expedition, then that could mean that you're going to struggle a bit with the rest of it and potentially either get exhausted or lose things on your way home. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I've only played as two, two of the characters so far. I've only played it as the uh, farmer who is like the like the easiest to get to grips of. And then there's two sort of middle characters who are the ranger and the crafter. Uh, the ranger, as I said, goes out on little expeditions. You can choose how long that's going to be. Uh, you've got three decks of cards and they will be like a certain difficulty and you have a uh, like a planning tile that will say things like uh, so for for this type of uh, short light easy mission you take two level one cards and one level two card and then like the next one might hmm. be two level uh, one level one and two level twos and then eventually it goes all the way up to I think it's like four level twos and uh, three level fours so it's qu- quite a long mission potentially I haven't managed to do one quite that. Like, I've managed to get through one of the ones that's a level below that, but I definitely was not prepared for it. It needed more going back to town, building up my skills, uh, yeah. doing more of the smaller missions to get the things, to get the skills, to get the money to yeah. to do other stuff. It, you had the option to skip past that sort of gentle, uh, that gentle ramp, yeah. but realistically you had to take that ramp the whole way up. You can't just kind of jump. That yeah, far up it. and and it is interesting that you can sort of drop it, have like drop in, drop out, drop in, drop out for players. Uh, it plays up to four. I don't know if you can play five simultaneously even with the expansion, but uh, yeah, and there's this whole story that's going on throughout the adventure. We've gone from uh, not really knowing the sprites to the sprites just being a regular part of the town, and they're they're regularly hanging out and getting involved in things. Sometimes they're helping us out if certain certain ha- things happen. You can go on little adventures, and the adventure deck expands depending on what events you've uncovered um, so far and, and what things have happened. Unlocked all sorts of other stuff. There's this whole plot point with uh, something very bad that seems to be happening, and everyone's trying to work out how to deal with it. There was potentially some chaotic spirit at one point that we were like, we need, might need to be careful about that, because... That could be something chaotic. I don't know what happened. I managed to avert whatever that was. And maybe I've upset one of the sprites in the process of that. But it seems like generally everything's okay with 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 the with the local spirits. Yeah. Also, maybe there's a, a giant golden stag kicking around somewhere that is either a portent of things that are very, very bad or very, very good. <laughs> I don't really understand yet. But it, it is, it's got such an engaging gameplay loop that, like... A few times I've sat down and I've gone, oh, I'll just play through one season. Because at the end yeah. of the season, there's like a, a little bit of, of reset stuff. Like you can pretty much reset it at the end of any day. Yeah. And there is ways of doing that. And the trays are designed fantastically in such a way that you everything sort of tucks away. And then you put a lid on the top of it and they all stack together and they sit in the box. Mm. So you can like literally it, save your game and come back to it. It, it keeps making me think of uh, Stray Gods in that save ability, yes. but also that it's very flexible how long of a play session you want to commit yeah. to yeah. that those kind of aspects. Oh yeah, it's it's exactly like that, and I think very much like Stray Gods, like it doesn't necessarily. I think it, it's maybe a little bit more open ended than Stray Gods. Like I've heard people say uh, that they have like they finished it in the course of. Like, five very intense days of playing it 16 hours a day, which seems like a good amount of content from a yeah. game. Um, and that, like, although it is open-ended and technically you don't ever have to stop, there is, like, a point where the story comes to an end. Yeah. Uh, but there's nothing to say you don't just keep doing the thing if that's still working for you. Mm. Uh, but also, it's, like, if you're paying attention, it is, I think, entirely resettable. Like, all of the event cards are numbered... So you yeah. can just keep, uh, you know, just put them back into the decks they came from. In my case, just to try and work out which things I've done, I've been putting them in back in the deck upside down, uh-huh. so that I've got some way of tracking like what's already like, been done. Sort of done. your progression level, kind of. And if like the other day where I I fuck up and accidentally don't put something in the uh, uh, uh. event deck, uh, and then realise that I've run out of cards in the event deck, so the story literally cannot progress. Yes. I was like, well, I I could trace it back. Like, I knew what my decisions were. It, well, I wasn't, like, so far in that I was completely lost. Yeah. But it was, like, 10, 15 minutes of going through, like, all the cards I'd been through already. Um, so, yeah, now I am just going, here, these are the upside down ones. These are right way up ones. 
but like entirely resettable. Um, yeah. And I probably will do when we, we start to play together so that you can experience all that from the beginning without going... Yeah, your character just made like fifty gold and uh, managed to raise like a whole bunch of stats in in the town. And my character doesn't really do very much at all because I've only just started playing with them. Oh, well, I, I, I hope you don't mind redoing some of it. Not at for all. Those purposes. Uh, not at all. Like if I if I think if I did mind, I'd be like, here is the recap on what's happened so far. Yeah. Pick any of the four characters and I'll just play someone else. Yeah. Like I'm also looking forward to like giving the other characters a go at, at some point because. There's two characters I haven't even touched yet. Like, I played, I think, probably my full first year just as the farmer. Yeah. And I was like, I've got to hang on that. I think, And it's it's easy enough to manage that I think I could do that on top of learning something else. And I learned and the other character from the manual, which is unusual for me. I usually end up looking up a video. Yeah. Uh, I, I learned that new character from their manual. It's very clear to do. I managed to work out all of their stuff. And I have been, like, two-handing that for... My last few play sessions, I think I'm now into like autumn of year three yeah. and, and feeling very competent with those characters, although I don't know what else is going to happen with the plot. I feel, <laughs> still, still feel like I've got basically half of the event deck left to explore, maybe yeah. slightly less based on, on the fact that obviously there were choices I didn't take. Yeah. Uh, just so many adventures and goals that I haven't engaged in and two secret uh, envelopes that I haven't opened. And again, like, you can very easily just go, I know what came out of those envelopes. I can put <laughs> it straight back and reset the whole game. Yeah. And either, you, I suppose you could pass it on, but, like, it, I wouldn't mind. Like any of those choose your own adventure things, like, yeah, I can just go back in and make different decisions if I want. Yeah. But, yeah, it's it's a lot of good fun, and I look forward to... Uh, I, will, I will report back when I have, um, I've got a bit further with it, and I, I will probably even stream some of it. I am excited for that. Yay! Have you played anything else? Um, no, that's it for me, really. Well then, <gasps> time for this. Ooh, what are you playing? Well, well, um, I'm playing. It's a it's a business management sim. Uh huh. Okay, okay. It's not a business management sim. It's a business management sim inside of a dating app mini game. A mini game. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. It's a business. It's a business management sim inside of a dating app mini game inside of a slot car racer. Like Skelectric or the ones where there's barriers against the side? Uh, kind of the one with the barriers on the side. Oh, but also like it. Oh, okay, it it's a business management sim inside of a dating app mini game inside of a slot car racer, which is inside of a dungeon crawler, and then uh -huh. and then that's inside of an RPG. So it's one of the cats catch the bird to catch the spider. That's one of the fly. To, I don't know why it's one of the fly. What is going on with this game? Well, okay, fine. That's all inside a creature battler, and then that's inside of a larger RPG. I think we're. I think we've gone through all the inception layers. I think originally it was an RPG. What if we're in a simulation and somebody is playing us, playing that, playing all the other? Uh... Well, if that's the case, there's a lot of content mm -hmm. in our mini game, I guess. Mm -hmm. I would like a mod to get rid of the capitalism, please. Um, and a blankie. Hello, and welcome to our YouTube channel. Uh, today, we're going to be trying out some of the hottest, latest gamer products for the uh, more experienced gamer. Oh, I know you what know. that means. They mean old. It's fine. They don't have to dance around it. Well, I can't dance around it with my hips, you know. No? Oh, goodness. Right, what have we got first? Well, first up, we've got this uh, heated blanket. Ah, oh, you might not think that's particularly gamer, but check this out. It's got cherry caps here on the controller. Feel the clicky. Ooh, oh, this is a good clicky, ooh, right? That's good clicky. That's, those are good balanced keys. Those aren't going to slide around on you. But also, it's got a, a whole bunch of different heat settings and <gasps> RGB. Ooh, fancy. Yes, if you want to feel like a elite cozy gamer and have the warmest toes while you're poning noobs, uh, you can try out the uh, RGB heated blanket with mechanical keyboard controller. Uh, that's available from Razer Plus for the mature gamer. Again, oh. they mean old. They do, they do mean old, I suppose. <laughs> they do, they do. It's Ooh. very cosy. Ooh. It's available in a series of tactical colours. And, of course, it's got all the good RGB lighting. Oh, wonderful. Look at that. I feel so pro. I'm, I'm lit gamer and I'm snug. Well, next up we've got the 
uh, Extreme Gamer Night Cream with Ooh. antioxidants. Oh, I'll need that for my skin. Hydrochloric acid. Hi- hi- hyaluronic, dear. Hi- I don't hyaluronic. Think so. Oh, uh, yes, sorry. Hydrochloric would be sorry. very bad sorry. for skin. Sorry, I've got to readjust my glasses. I need to, I need oh, to get yes. my prescription updated. No, you buy focals, dear. Lean down, lean oh, down. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, and they're, they're available in limited edition... Tactical bacon scent. Oh, uh, that's uh, that's probably about the most gamer thing in the world. And last up, we've got uh, the latest product. It's caffeinated gamer trifle. Oh, look at the spoons, RGB. An too. RGB spoon. It yes. wouldn't be a gamer product without RGB exactly. lights installed. Look at that. It's got RGB lights in. It's got a uh, fully carbon fiber. This is the most. Highly powerful tactical gamer spoon for gamers, and also the sherry is in this trifle is really rather good oh, and it rather is. strong. I will be very careful about putting that spoon in the microwave, though. I'm not sure I would trust it. I'm I don't know how carbon fiber reacts in a microwave, but I'm not about to find out. And so, if you're an elite gamer and uh, happen to be of an age like ourselves, then why not? Try out some of our products. These are the sherry ladies, and we're we're off now for another tactical game of sherry. And I'm going to finish this trifle. <laughs> so, huh, what have you put in your eyes? I've really not put a lot new in my eyes. It's it, not been it's, a big it's, eyes it's, week. It's been a it's been a big week for putting all the all the, the yakuza in my eyes. Really, Yahoo's. all of the yakuzings. Um. Watched an interesting YouTube video this evening. Uh, this may be worth talking about. Yes. Uh, watched a strange Eons video called "A Very Deep Dive into Reality Shifting," which yes. I thought was an interesting view, specifically from the perspective of so reality shifting is basically there are people online who believe they can travel to parallel realities yes. and there is a lot of overlap within described experiences of things like lucid dreaming um, uh, self-hypnosis indeed i think the thing that like really surprised me about this video was the portions of this that become sort of hey i'm going to talk about this from the perspective of someone who did maladaptive daydreaming as yes. a teen and who used to escape into very vivid imagined fantasy worlds of my own as an escape from from what was going on. Yeah. I thought it was a very interesting and respectful angle to come to something like that from. Yeah. I think the, um, the whole video is, I think, generally very respectable, especially like having the interview towards the yeah. end with someone who is like very heavily into that community I, and being like, it's not for me. I don't necessarily believe that's the case, but like, I thank you for giving your opinion. I, and... I think the video did a really good job of going I don't... uh, My personal view is that it's probably one of these explanations that probably makes the most sense. And for me, the video maker, I could not let myself do this because it would be dangerous for myself in these ways. Yeah. While also acknowledging it is... It seems to be generally a positive and helpful for the people that it is helpful for. And here is what, what... How the disagreement they would have with my perspective on what that is, and to, to just let that be that, and to go, yeah. it is helpful for some people, it is actively going to be dangerous for other people, yes. but here is the many ways you can view it. Yeah. And I think there there were some very interesting angles of discussion in yeah. it. I think it's quite interesting from uh, from a similar sort of point of view, like not that I am capable of uh, like visually imagining that type of stuff, because uh, thanks Aphantasia, but from uh, from the point of view of someone who got quite heavily into self hypnosis and yeah. hypnosis and um like uh, not quite new age spiritualism but like weird fantasy like folk spirituality uh like when I was a teenager and how that was definitely not good for me like none of that was particularly good for me in fact it like properly messed me up for quite a long time in in many ways. But, like, I, I, I can see, like, from Strange's view of, yeah, actually, as someone who was into all, all of that, if you did fall into a community where they were like, yeah, you can go to other worlds, like, you can go to any other world that you two choose to dream of because multiverse theory, and you can, that, that means that, like, you, everything is possible. There is a world where everything exists. And there is a world where you live a life where you are happier and freer and there is less capitalism around to cause problems. It Here are the tools to turbocharge your escapism. Yeah. Is a real 
real promising option when life sucks. Yes. Um, so yeah, that that was an interesting watch. It I really was surprised was. at how well I got on with that video. Yeah. Uh, what about you? What have you watched this week? Uh, so I watched uh, the latest documentary from People Make Games Ooh. called The Murder Game Revolution That Has Gripped China. Uh, this is about uh, Jibensha. Do you know anything uh, about this? Not by name. What is that? Uh, so, you know, like uh, murder mystery dinner parties. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that. It's uh, basically a whole multi, uh, multi-million multi dollar industry uh, that has sort of sprung up out of the concept of basically tabletop role-playing, t- tabletop role-playing the uh, m- murder mystery dinner party type theme. But for the most part, these days, it is, uh, here is, a, here is, a, we're gonna get six people together, and they are, usually it's gonna be three men and three women, mm. and, and that is how we have written the stories, and you don't necessarily know everyone that's there, like, you might just play with a, a few randoms, mm. and in many ways, it, it is almost set up for, like, hey, look, everyone is very busy, this is a good way of, Doing a social activity and maybe meeting some new people. Okay. While also, like, it, they're, it, they're, they're saying, like, it's quite a good way of, of breaking the ice with people because when you've got to just try and come up with conversation with someone, that can be quite difficult, especially if you're someone who's a little bit socially awkward. But uh, if you are playing a character and maybe somebody else there is supposed to be, like, a sibling or something, you have, like... W- like a different way of talking yeah. to that person and engaging with that I can person. I certainly vouch for that as someone who has used D anD D as a crutch for learning social interaction. Exactly. I get it. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's just a fascinating story of how it went from being like just sort of home games that people played to this whole industry of like yeah, that we go to this place and and maybe there's like six different rooms all doing different ones. Uh, the fact that the government is currently cracking down on them, like the Chinese government is concerned about a lot of the themes, it being murder mystery. Um, Quinn's talked a lot about the fact that th- there's sometimes very difficult subject matter. Um, okay. Content warning for uh, mentions of sexual assault in that video. Yeah. Uh, things like there might be, you, there might be a character. Who has had that experience, and that is written for them, and then there will be part of the story where maybe one of the players is basically being encouraged to help cover that up. Oh, so c- could be quite a lot, uh, quite a lot for some some people. And there seems to be like a whole cultural issue of the places writing these things and running these things will say, "No, we don't. We we don't have any of that sort of." Tr- trigger warnings and trauma stuff here because yeah. we're, we're, you know, not as easily, you know, we're, we're not like you, snowflakes, blah, 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 yeah. type, type, type sentiment. I, like, yes. not that exactly, but, um, obviously quite pro- pro- problematic if, you know, somebody there has had that experience and then for the next, like, you've gone into this whole situation, like, I guess it's quite expensive to go and, and do these days and commit to a few hours of playing this part. And you've maybe had that dumps on you quite early on. Yeah. Uh, so apparently, like the, a lot of the government stuff is like you've got to be careful about um, the types of content you're talking about, and obviously that's true. But also, some of it feels a little bit uh, controlly in the wrong kind of way, as governments are occasionally yeah. want to do. I I understand both perspectives of that. I think there is definitely you could learn something from the model of how um like. D and D in a castle and events like that are yeah, run where like it's like red you, cart, red cart yeah, and stuff. you you turn up and and a DM is going to be running a game for you for a few yeah. days and the way that they handle you know sensitive topics in a setting where you've paid a lot of money and are going to be kind of be stuck here yeah engaging with the material well, you'd like to hope that for something like that you know you've got like a a li- like a trigger sheet type thing uh, or like a session zero where you talk yeah. about. Things like that, and or you have tools like red carding, yes, uh, for how you want to do things. Ideally, it shouldn't be you know government intervention should shouldn't be preventing topics from being on the table. But that to not have that kind of intervention, you need 
the people running these games to, you know, be respectful of the fact that that might be a need they might need to fulfill. Don't which... be an edge lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I guess again, you know, like we've both watched a decent number of like D and D horror stories of somebody wanted to to exist in a world of this awful thing or that awful thing or. The DM who's like, oh yeah, slavery exists in my world and it's okay because I, I said so and it's, it's, it's orcs or whatever. Like, you, some people do seem to want to play D&D with, like, to act out the worst things yeah. uh, about themselves. And I think that, that if that, that is that person telling you some things about themselves and you should probably listen to those things and make your decision yeah. about whether you want to continue hanging out with that person, but. Like, there are a good number of people who want to, like, take the time and not hurt other people while, you know, having uh, what is supposed to be a fun time playing fantasy games. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that, that is a fascinating, like, 45-minute video about the whole uh, the industry going and, and trying it out and the fact that maybe there is, that, that whole thing is in danger and, like, a lot of the problem is a lot of it hasn't been translated. Yeah. into other languages, so if the Chinese government end up just completely shutting the whole industry down, that like that could be a whole cool way of storytelling with people that ends up getting lost. Yeah. So, spread the word, talk about the thing, and but also maybe encourage uh, harm reduction. In, yeah. In, in that. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but I always find that people make games and stuff is thought-provoking and really interesting, and they pick very good subject material. Oh, yeah. I am I am always going to eventually watch anything they put out. <laughs> Even if occasionally it's like, mm, this looks like it might be a bit heavy, I'm going to give this a week. Yeah. I'm in a slightly better headspace. If nothing else, you can laugh at Quinn's knocking over a glass of water twice in the space of about five minutes. Cool. <laughs> uh, have you watched anything else? Uh, not really. All, all my free time has been, been infinitely I've watching. Watched, I've watched this wealth infinitely. Yeah, you know, I've I've occasionally been doing work and gone, what shall I put on on my phone? Well, I could put I could watch somebody else someone play. else play <laughs> Infinite Wealth, because I've already played through the start, so I know what's going on, so I can sort of half pay attention. Hashtag I, I've been really just burying myself in that game. It seems like it, it's very easy to it, do. Yeah, what about you? You watched anything else? No, that's pretty much it. I've watched you play Like a Dragon. Yeah, you have. <laughs> How, how's it been to watch? Oh, it's fun. <laughs> like, I, you know, don't know too much of the plot, and I've been able to follow it, and it's been, like, seems like it's been a lot of fun. It's, uh, I, I will say of the start of that game, that game opened, uh, I know, we're, I'm putting the game back <laughs> into the watch section, but fuck it, I, I didn't watch anything, really. Um, I am... I love how much of the start of that game is just everything is great, everything is lovely, everything is so perfect, you know the shoe's gonna drop and at some the point. And then the fire attack. And it's just so... I don't see how the other shoe could drop. This is so perfect. What could even go... Okay, fine. It's very effectively done. Mm -hmm. I just want each one to be okay. He's, 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 so, okay. he's, he's so precious. He's got the power of friendship. He's so precious. He's gotta be okay. He's got the power of friendship. He's got a hermit crab friend. He does have a hermit crab friend and a, 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 a crawfish. And a crawfish. And it's karaoke. So He's the number one person in Hawaii at singing one particular karaoke song in my playthrough. <laughs> he's he's the best at singing that one song, that, that kind of cr cringy gamer song that I genuinely, unironically love of him. Of him being like, I'm going to be a hero. I'm going to do it. They're going to be the very best, like no one ever was. <laughs> he's going to level up, be the best that he can be. He's not going to stop until he's a hero. <laughs> The song's Never like a goals. minute and a half long, and it's very, it's sweet. They're always fun. Yeah. Anyway, that I've not watched anything. Well then, <gasps> time for this. Hey, Laura. Yeah. We got a new sponsor. <gasps> Who's our new sponsor? Well, do you uh, want to get involved in investment bank banking? Hang on, no. Um. Investment yeah, that, you, that doesn't sound right. Are you saving up for a new yacht? Yacht. You know, I think I'm looking at this. I'm pretty sure our ads have gotten mixed up with some other podcasts because I don't think this fits our audience demographics. I don't think so either. I, I, has has the audience turned off all of their cookies and gathering stuff, and now the people who give us ad to read just 
don't know what they're interested in and therefore assume that we're maybe a market for that. You know what it it might be? I did try something the other week. I did just try saying into my phone, like, investment banking over and over and over again in the hopes that, like, somewhere the internet would get the idea that we have an audience that has money and that, like might be worth, like, big, expensive sponsors sponsoring us. And we do have a doubt double-barreled surname, so I guess right? maybe that does play And off. I'm looking at the thing. They're, they're paying... They're paying... They're sure, they sure are paying. So oh, I, uh, sure. Well, then, listener, do you want to get involved in boring and more boring investment? But really, that's what they're called. Perfect for when you're saving up for a new yacht... Uh, or a new yurt, or a guest house, or a holiday home, or a new conservatory, or a new Lexus. Uh, that's boring and more bored. Investment banking dot very serious dot net. Enter the code QNPS292 and I don't know what they do. Money is what they do. Yeah, but they I don't have enough money to find out what their money does. <laughs> Inside the boardroom of Supremacy Software. Hi. Hi. So, uh I I got I got I, I got I got to run something by you. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. uh I've been keeping an eye for the last couple of months on a a, a, a project. Right. Uh, yeah. Not yeah, not yeah. one of ours, but uh, Wrong. some right. some okay, some yeah. fan out there has been making a very well received uh, little fan project. Right. Uh, based yeah, yeah. on on uh, you know that horror, very hard to survive in, collect souls. Yeah. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of game. Yeah. That, that you know that one uh, the the yeah the yeah. souls thing. Yeah. And, they're making uh, a little silly cart racer. And, yeah. Like we were never gonna do. And no, we were never going to do yeah. that. And to be honest, I played that. That is good. Right. That is and a like, good fun. And like, game. look, yeah. they're not taking money for it, no. and you know, it has done a great deal of work for like building the brand. Oh and yeah, people getting us free advertising. Yeah, people. You know, a lot of people talk about that, and a lot of people come back to us. That has really helped uh, pick up uh, a lot of sales in recent years. You know. The drop off on that is, you know, it's we're we're well past our our prime yeah, exactly, on repeat sales. Exactly, on that. but. But yeah, they're about to release it. Oh, oh, then we absolutely have to just cut that off. Yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah, like yeah, I know it's been, I know it's been good free publicity, yeah, but yeah. like, oh yeah, they can't, you know, like finish it because then no. it's playable, and then yeah. they made a thing with that name on it. We didn't. It's yeah, like, you know, yeah. well, it's all hypothetical. That's great. You know, yeah, make your hypothetical yeah, thing that's yeah. free advertising for us. But yeah. like, you know, you're ninety nine percent at the finish line. Yeah, fuck off with that. Why did you think we'd let you yeah, do it? Yeah, blue shell for you. Exactly. Why did you think our not shutting you down yet meant that we were okay with it? We were waiting until you were nearly done. That's the fun time to cancel. That's shit. the funnest time to just crush all your hopes and dreams, and you know, all that time you spent. Learning how to program in that ancient, you know, coding style and that graphic style. Exactly. And, you know. uh, on a similar note, yeah. Um, how long do you think it would get take for us to uh, get get the uh, code monkeys downstairs to whip one of that up that we could sell? That we could sell. Oh, um, you know, it doesn't have to be good. So you know, probably you know, like a, a week or two. I mean, we got we got that press conference coming up on Friday. I think it would be real fucking funny if we announced with our own version of it by then. That'd be that'd be fucking funny. You are a fucking genius. I know. So, <gasps> what have you put in your ears? Um, I put all the karaoke tracks from Like a Dragon and Put a Wealth <laughs> into my ears. Um, there's there's the, the, the one I'm gonna level up, and it's Ichiban singing about, about using gamer terms to, to be, he's, he's gonna live his best life, and it's not as cringy as, a, as that should be. There's, ah, uh, shouldn't be cringy. Yeah. There's there's one where Kiryu sings about uh he's got a machine gun full of kisses. He's not just gonna give you one kiss or two kisses or three kisses. He's got a full clip full of kisses oh, hey. in his machine. He's gun gonna unload kisses on you. Yeah, he's got his machine gun of love. That's like again weirdly catchy song for something that's like so <laughs> thematically stupid. Yeah, genuinely, I've been loving the English. the The English translations and dubs of the karaoke tracks are very well done in that they are. They're sung in the way that someone who isn't a professional singer but is giving it the role at karaoke sings them. I mean, I imagine they have to be because they're not entirely localised, are they? They're more translated, which means that they don't necessarily always 
follow a structure the, where all the syllables yeah, fit in. The easily. songs are a little stilted in their lyricism, but that's kind of where half the charm is. Well, that gives like it's... more, like more to that vibe of like you're not a professional singer, yeah. you're someone and who's just it's, enjoying themselves it's got, at karaoke. A lot of the songs, the way they're written lyrically, reminds me of like when someone goes up to karaoke to sing "Tribute" by Tenacious D. It's <laughs> this is a stupid song. But it's the kind of song that if it existed in in the world, it'd be like, oh no no, everyone knows the song and is going to sing along when it comes on at yeah. the karaoke. Like when when the death metal song about the the hot pot stew of of darkness comes on, uh-huh. your love is redder than kimchi. Uh, bathe it in the in the in the blood of anger or whatever it is. Singing about okay. putting all the various ingredients in this angry death angry metal soup. hot pot. Yeah, it's just angry death metal soup song. Uh-huh. Like, I'm like. I could see people getting behind that at the at the karaoke, and then you occasionally just have a song where it'll be like, "I, you know what is really nice in context." And I know I'm making this the Infinite Wealth episode. I'm fucking <laughs> doing it. Why not? Um, I like that at least at the start of this game, when it's just Ichiban and and Kiryu, that there's a lot of just singing sincere, sweet songs about their feelings, and whoever's not singing the song will be very passionately cheering them on in the background, yes. like yeah, like. You know, K- Kiri will be singing a song about like, "Hey, I want to be a good dad." And there was this one time where I had had a kid for a while, and like your hands were so tiny, and eventually you would grow up and do things. And like, what what will you do with your tiny little baby hands? And Ichibots at the side being like, "Yeah, you're doing it. Go have feelings on on a microphone." Yeah, and I'm like. That's good supportive male friendship right there. Yeah. Is you can be like, hell yeah, your, your kid had tiny little hands. Yeah, then. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I've been listening to. What about you? <laughs> uh, I've been listening to the latest SCP Archives series. So rather Ooh. than uh, like um, individual episodes with individual SCPs, there has been a whole series, a 10 part series called The Class of 76, Mm -hmm. which started out seemingly about uh, some kind of school massacre, maybe, that happened, and then becomes this weird little tale of rural life in uh, 1970s, um, very small town America, like in the middle of the woodland, like teenagers, one of whom is played by Brian David Gilbert. Uh, I was like, I know that voice. and like they're they're just goofy kids, you know. There's there's band practice and the big game, and everyone's excited to that. And maybe they're gonna go up to somewhere near the lake and 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 you know have a few brewskis that oh probably not really old enough to be drinking because America and and such and like small town cop stuff. And also maybe there's a whole bunch of people that are convinced that there's like a satanist cult that have moved Ooh. in to the village and that's why there's all this graffiti turning up and m- maybe just maybe like there's been like a local kid who's been kidnapped who's gonna be sacrificed to s- something and it that 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 story goes some places it sounds it. it it goes a lot of places over the course of like nearly eight hours and uh yeah that that is it's it's a fascinating story. It's it's a little bit dark. It's very strange. There are you will you will probably think you've got some handles on a, f- a few bits of it, and then there will still be a few twists at the end. No. And also, Brian David Gilbert is there, being a very passable teenager because he just sounds so wee. <laughs> he he has young boy voice. He do he, he do. do. Uh, what about you? Have you listened to anything else? Uh, not really. No. Well then. <gasps> Time for this. You uh, want some of that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <sighs> oh. You know, like billionaires, yeah. 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 You know how, like, there's really, you know, the main problem is that billionaires are just like sucking everything up. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like that. Yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, number go up and all that. Number go up. Like they're all just <sighs> obsessed with 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 number go up. Yeah, and uh, and the thing is, right, that you know, 
that is just you know unsustainable, right? Yeah, Number yeah, yeah. cannot possibly go up forever. So like, what if yeah we could like reskin Cookie Clicker or something, yeah? Yeah. And convince them that that was like their banking app or or whatever. Oh yeah, yeah. Like completely replace their you know their financial advice and just go look you know you 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 clicked on the thing num number go up right yeah because that's all you care about yeah you right? clicked on the thing and it said you bought something yeah and now number going up faster yeah you're, right. you're getting more money faster because you clicked on that button yeah. you very smart businessman yeah you know and if you're the kind of egotistical weirdo who needs to feel like they invented all the things you know where then maybe there's a, a, a setting we can engage to be like you have invented a, the first flying car or, yeah. or whatever you know and it's uh, like a button you press it's like you know all you're really doing is like putting like your name that's like bi billionaire bob's flying car you know yeah, you put yeah, your name yeah. on it and you press the button and now you invented that yeah yeah it's like those, um, you know, you used to get those like uh, HTML stories back in the day, and it like there'd be a bunch of pop ups, and like you'd basically mad libs in a bunch of things into the pop ups, and then it would like tell you a story yeah, yeah, with yeah. All, all of the, the, you know, the bits you put into it, yeah, and be, be like that. But you know, maybe then we could get on with fixing the problems of the world, you know, now that we've got rid of all the greedy bastards and their, uh, you know, destructive behaviour. Yeah, that sounds like a... That sounds, that sounds like they probably do it, doesn't it? I mean, it worked for me, I think. Yeah. <laughs> right, well... I'm afraid I've got some pretty bad news from the uh, numbered bods. Oh, no. Yeah, well, well so, uh, y you know how we've been continuously making profit year on year? Uh, eternal continuous growth, yes. Eternal continuous growth. We get the most fantastic bonuses and we're, we're top of top of our league. Year on year record profits number always eternally going up. Not just record revenue, record profit forever. Exactly. Well, the, the numbers bods are saying that we're not going to be able to make record profits again next year. Oh, why not? Well, I mean, I I said exactly the same thing. We've raised the price uh, to, of, of our games to £70. Yep, we've done that. We've introduced a constant stream of limited edition DLC. Yep, uh, we, we started charging for early access a week before release. Exactly. And then we fired increasingly larger numbers of our employees to avoid paying bonuses every year, just in uh, just in time for us to get lots of bonuses and the shareholders to do very well. We've hoovered up every little bit of IP in sight. Well, then what's, what's the problem? Well, we, we don't have a product or uh, anyone who knows how to make one. We uh -oh. considered using AI, but it turns out no one actually knows how to work an AI in order that it might maybe spit out a game, and when we tried it all, it all came out very badly and not something I think we could reasonably, even us, get away with charging no. £70 pounds for a year, and certainly not something we'd know anything about getting uh, any DLC into. Um, of course, the average uh, uh, gamer now, it turns out, can't afford our product anyway, because we keep making everyone unemployed, and and to be honest, a lot of our employees got into making games because they loved games and we fired them all and now they can't afford to buy any, any of our games. Oh, well, um, I've got a suggestion. Right, yeah. How about we fire the numbers people? The numbers bods, they're, yeah. They're the ones bringing us all this bad news. Oh, yeah. That'll well, fix that, the problem. Exactly. That. We fire the numbers bods, we won't get any more bad news about the numbers. And also, we'll have all of their paychecks. Exactly. Oh, this wonderful, cannot fail. Wonderful, wonderful. Do you know what I want to see more of? What do you want to see more of? Brochure Justice Warriors. Brochure Justice Warriors? Yeah. 
Right, Larry. Right, Larry. How are you doing? Oh, you know, a little bit under the weather, mate. A little bit. Uh, got the old. Got the old summer cold, I guess. Spring, spring, I guess. More, yeah. more likely, really. Yeah. You, you doing all right? Oh, I'm all right. You know, yeah. I was a little under the weather too, but now I've uh, I've been I've been playing that that new life of dragon. I've been uh, that's that's powered me through. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Real, real digging it. Yeah, I, I uh, particularly like the uh, the mission with the the bird. Yeah, oh, yeah, got, yeah. To, got to look after that little bird. Keep it safe. Yeah, keep it safe bird in your little ha- hair nest. Yeah, maybe bird his roommate. Yeah. Exactly, but yeah. I, it scored me. You know, you know, occasionally a bit of media will get you thinking about a real world issue if it's a well done bit. You know, yeah, you know, yeah, well, they, you know, they're not shying away from you know the, the yeah. real. Uh, perils in the world yeah. well yeah she got me thinking about you know uh, the the way that people people who have been in the criminal justice system or you know who are deemed deemed criminal by their existence yeah. you know often get trapped in two cycles of you know uh, existing within the criminal justice system yeah like, you know like i know in the in the uk like you know, a lot of uh job interview uh or, or job application forms will include like you have, uh, have to make a declaration about your your uh, yeah, do, do you have a criminal record? And you know, yeah, you know, I understand that in in certain uh, certain types of of work, obviously, you need to you know have certain yeah. checks. And but if you can't get a job, yeah, and in in theory, you're not supposed to be discriminated against because of that. But we all know the reality is, you know, the second you put a yes in that box. You know, they'll find some convenient reason other than that to be why you didn't get the job or whatever. But you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've I've uh, experienced you know working in industries where I've literally heard a manager say that they, you know, that, that a certain surname didn't sound uh, like they were going to understand what this person was saying and oh. immediately thrown that person's uh, CV in the bin. And yeah. So naturally, I didn't stay at that job very long. But it, I, yeah. I obviously I do understand that. Those sorts of people are in hiring positions, well, and that's yeah. not good. It's unfortunate, you know. It's I think no matter where you go in the world, you end up with a lot of similar systems where, yeah. like, you know, uh, a criminal record can make it, uh, you know, harder to get a job, which yeah. makes it harder to keep, you know, keep stable employment coming in and a roof over your head, yeah, yeah, which yeah. can make it more difficult to, you know find ways that are not crime to continue to survive. Yeah, and, you it's know, like, what do you expect me to do? You know, you've you've said that, you know, there is this justice system and, you know, I've I've served a prison sentence and, you know, maybe there there's some sort of probation period after that, but what are you actually doing to help rehabilitate people back into yeah. society rather than just going, yes, you did a terrible thing and now nah, we've completely ripped uh, you out yeah. of your life and we're not going to do anything yeah. to stop you potentially reoffending as feeling like it's the only only way to uh, continue surviving yeah. really. some of the some of the ones that really frustrate me are the ones where like you know uh, there'd be such a clear easy pathway to getting someone back into employment after yeah, yeah, you know yeah. after being in prison and you know whether you know the prison system as it currently exists is its whole other discussion but the one that really annoys me is in America where so often prisoners uh you know uh will will end up doing work for the for the uh, the fire service you know putting out yeah, yeah, you know yeah, putting yeah. out fires particularly doing like dangerous work putting out wildfires yeah, yeah, yeah. and will log like countless hours doing you know, very like doing professionally trained firefighting yeah, work, yeah. and then leave the Specialist you know le- equipment. And, yeah, yes. leave the prison system and be deemed ineligible to work in the fire service because they have a criminal record. That is just yeah. a job you cannot go into if you have a criminal record in many places. Despite the fact you did that job perfectly well, you know, when you were being paid less than minimum wage, yeah. you know, you know, the prison system being being and slave it's not like generally by another name any, as it any is. single person from, from a fire team is going out on their own. So it's not like they're not gonna, you know, have other people to to monitor if they're in, you know, perhaps a very sensitive situation that, you know, might yeah. need some certain source of care or, or you know, people might have concerns about based on whatever they look, had been arrested look, for. If you've been arrested for starting fires, maybe you're not allowed to have a job yeah, you know, yeah, uh, putting out yeah. fires. But like, as a, a blanket rule to go, you have a criminal record, no being if able to fight fires. A, uh, you know, like a, a, a small amount of uh, an arrest, a restable amount of, you know... Uh, a uh, non rel- relatively harmless drug. Yeah, yeah, and you know that's those are the examples that really frustrate me. Where it's like, you know, that person has served their time, but they've also developed a skill that would allow them to get back into the yeah, workforce yeah, in yeah. a relatively well paid position and like get their life back on track. And that opportunity is shot off to them. Yeah, you've got, you know, I, I you know. Uh, the criminalisation of homelessness uh, is very similar in that oh, yeah, you know yeah. if someone is 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 homeless 
you know, they they probably can't get a bank account, which probably prevents them getting somewhere to live, prevents them getting a job. They end up getting arrested for being homeless and yeah. then come back out. And what's, potentially get a, a fine for, you know, for yeah, being homeless. Exactly. You know, if they come out of prison, what what's going to have changed? They're still homeless. They still can't get a bank account, yeah, which yeah. means they can't get a job, which means they can't get a home again, which means they're back in the system. Yeah, meanwhile, you've got NIMBYs going, oh, we don't want any kind of, you know, we why, why should we paying for them to be re- rehabilitated? Because you're creating a bigger problem yeah. by not I, allowing ways, I mean, pathways back into society. Yeah. Well, if you look at like any of the studies that have happened of uh, giving homeless people just completely no strings attached, just money and setting them up with a bank account yeah. and making and like and working with banks to go, it, like we'll set you up a bank account despite the fact you don't have a permanent address. Yeah. Here is X amount of money per month, just uh, guilt free. Uh, the studies re- like re- regularly uh, demonstrate that those people use the money largely to get accommodation, get a roof over their head, which allows them to get a job. Yeah. And I think, you know, something very similar that you would have a nightmare time trying to su- suggest because, you know, NIMBYs would be all over yeah. it. Giving, is, giving money to criminals. Yeah, well, you're you not know, giving criminal money to me, are you? If nothing else, saying like the first couple of months after you come out of prison, you know, th- there might be a fund available to go. You get a certain amount of money every month so that you can get started back in the system yeah. and uh, have enough of a roof over your head to re-enter you know, that system. I mean, I think something like that needs to be uh, kept in place, uh, that they need a roof over their heads, yeah. they need uh, an address that they can use to look for a job, yeah. and they need to find and be, uh, have been able to show that they are st- able to stay in that um, yeah. employment and there needs to be a, a buffer where you know if that it turns out that job isn't working for yeah. whatever reason or you know there's some issues with the employer or you know or, or someone has some issue some someone has some issue has come up that there is an option for them to fall back into that so that they can get another job. But also, you know, I am a great believer in UBI anyway, well, so exactly. I think everyone should have a roof yeah. over their heads. Well, I mean, I, enough, I, enough I agree with you entirely, but in a world where that doesn't exist yet, I think the big thing is just, again, making sure that you are not punishing people once their punishment in theory has ended. Yeah, you yeah. know, And I'm, I'm a big believer, as long as the crime is not like specifically you know, a risk to the job you're applying for. Yeah. Generally speaking, the fact that you served time for a crime should not prevent you getting a job later. Yeah. If that job is nothing to do with the crime that you did, you know, it, it, all you're doing by preventing that person from getting a job is pushing them into a situation where they cannot get back into society. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that you know, people, people say they want less crime. The way you get less crime is treating people who have come out of prison yeah. as human beings who want to get back into society. Yeah, as opposed to someone who needs to be eternally punished uh, for for something that they did. Maybe maybe they didn't even do in some cases. You know, uh, yeah. occasionally people are incorrectly uh, sentenced for things and especially... You know, ethnic minorities, especially in America, you know, we, yeah. we, we know that there's there's profiling that goes on. People who are perhaps in the wrong place at the wrong time end up with criminal records and yeah. no way to do. And then even worse, those people potentially yeah. fall to crime because they ended up in a situation where their lives had been destroyed by, you know, false a- accusations or whatever and ended up in a, in a terrible situation that, that now now they've got nothing and, and end up actually having to fall to crime. Therefore, you've manufactured a criminal yeah. by being it's, a racist. It's just thinking of people who've been arrested for crimes as humans still. Yeah. Like, a little bit of his sidetrack, but the th- there's one thing I, I think about a lot, which is the fact that uh, I believe it's Germany where uh, if you attempt to break out of prison and you don't do any, you know, additional crimes on top of trying to break out of prison, you know, you do a non-violent escape attempt, they do not add any time to your, your uh, sentence if you're caught because they believe a person has, like, it is a very human thing to want to escape captivity. And it's yeah. that kind of stopping and going, a person in prison is still a human being. Yeah. And, you know, they deserve to be looked at through the lens of your behaviours are human and you yeah. are still a person. Yeah. You know, and I know it's not one-to-one related, but I think that sort of line of thinking is important. That That thinking of, like, just because someone has done a thing that is deemed criminal should not mean that you stop thinking of them as a human being yeah, yeah, yeah. who deserves every every bit of kindness and understanding that generally humans are granted. Yeah, and, you know, generally we've seen that most people who are not desperate 
for food or housing. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, the, the, the basic essentials that everybody needs to live when they are not forced to fight for those things or desperate for those things or just unable to access those things yeah. that they don't take desperate actions and they don't do shitty things to other people. They don't go stealing from other people or hurting other people or, you know, trying to... Be getting involved in, in various types of organised crime. They don't need to do any of that because they they have their basic needs met. But yeah. you know there are too many. The, the, the capitalism really has, has done its thing of well, no, why why should I have to pay for that? Why should we be paying f for that? That that is a bad person. You know, yeah. we've given them a conviction, and therefore they're a bad person. They're always a bad person, and you know, they can never be uh, any any good ever. Well, at that point, you're you're basically. You're you're basically the kind of person who wants the death sentence, although you're probably too much of a coward to say it. Yeah, it's 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 really shitty, and we do, you know, as as you say, we need to, you know, treat people like human beings. Yeah, perhaps some pe times people uh, have done wrong, and they do need to be punished in a certain way. But also, we need to look at rehabilitation because that is just as important and just uh, just as an essential part. Of uh, and a, a system of justice, if you you know, if that is what you are insisting, you have. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Fancy, mate. Oh yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Good luck, mate. Good luck. All right, I think I'll go and uh, get myself a hot lemon drink. Oh, sounds good, sounds good. Oh, it's nice. So, Laura. Yes? You do things on those things that are on the internet and people can find those things and where can people find those things? With stuff I do on the internet yeah. and stuff. You can find it at Laura K. Buzz pretty much everywhere on the internet. Laura K. Buzz on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, TikTok, Mastodon, Blue Sky, Patreon. That's the one that pays the bills. As little as a dollar a month over there allows me to keep doing this stuff full time. Um... Things you can see this week over on YouTube will include um, a video about uh, cross-platform controller support on console and the the back and forth battle between the fact that like it's not officially supported by console manufacturers but it's only really being supported by cheating device manufacturers that obviously the console makers aren't that happy about uh, and the accessibility sort of battle going on there. And there'll also be a video up this week about uh, migraines and gaming accessibility. Uh, I had one migraine and was like, I should talk to someone who's had more than one migraine and talk about vi th how that with video games. How can I turn my excruciating agony into content? Exactly! I'm like, hello, I had one migraine. I can think of things that would have helped me in that one moment, but you have them fairly regularly. Jeffrey Bunting, who does freelance stuff, including at uh, Wired. I've been in a couple of his pieces there. Uh -huh. uh, like you have them fairly regularly. What what are your thoughts as someone with more with more than just one experience to draw from? T tell me the things that I that I might not have the the breadth of experience to know on this. Yeah, so if um, I ever have one of these in future, I know more. And how will uh, how will you find accessibility things yeah. useful? Because you mentioned uh, on on the stream like what one thing that would be really useful to you is. If it had the um, oh. like navigation options of uh, The Last of Us. Oh yeah, let 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 me turn off the screen and just play via audio cues would have really helped. Yeah, I my my biggest issue was was light. Mm. I was like, if I can just like take light out of the equation, I could keep gaming. Mm. And like little thoughts like that. But we had a really good discussion about granular settings options that already kind of exist, but developers aren't thinking about them in the context of. How could we tweak these a little mm. to be supportive for more than one group of disabled players? Another one of those, this is already somewhat useful, maybe think yeah. about it in slightly it's, different ways. Put migraines on the list of things you think about, and you might quickly realise that you're not very far away from offering support for that group of people already. Yeah. Um, so yeah, re really nice little 25 minute chat that was, uh, it's been really nice having finding the excuse to do more of these little just chat with someone about accessibility on a regular basis yeah. bits. So, 
Yeah, what about you? Where are you on the internet? Me? Well, I don't have the unified branding, so I've got a link tree. It's linktr.ee slash janiac, J-A-N-E-I-A-C. I've got uh, music I make, t-shirts I design, occasionally I write things, and uh, yeah, I stream. Uh, and you can find my ways to support me at patreon.com slash stonedmonkeyradio. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help me justify all of the time that I put in for creating things to make people feel entertained and such. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Laura, you yeah. have? Will you sing us out, please, darling? <gasps> Until next time, be a stranger.